Friends, welcome to church. It's so good to see you this morning. I am grateful that we all survived such a weird and wild week, and we made it here this morning. If you are new to Wood Street Worship, we would love to get the chance to know you and to greet you by name. We have some name tags over here. There's also a QR code in your program, so if you're new, we would love for you to scan that and give us just a little bit of contact info so we can be in touch. Today is our final Sunday of our sermon series on the Beatitudes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So together we will explore the idea of mercy. What does it mean to receive God's mercy? As we gather in this place, let us join our hearts and our voices in our call to worship. God, we are here. We are here to be challenged. God, we are here. We are here to be comforted. God, we are here. We are here to be blessed and to bless what is. God, we are here. Let us worship God. Let's rise together this morning and sing. We'll sing holy, holy, holy.
The crowds gathered on the mountain to hear Jesus speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are you. Blessed are all of you. We come to confession to dwell in God's blessing and to remember and recall the ways in which God's grace is always with us. So let us confess together. You promise us grace, meeting us in every moment with mercy and forgiveness. We struggle to extend that same grace to our family members, to our neighbors, to strangers and enemies, and to ourselves. Lord, have mercy, that we might have mercy. Forgive us for resolving to bless ourselves and help us to bless what is here and now. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, bringing life to the earth as it springs from the ground. The sun will rise, the sun will rise, won't you dry all your tears, lay your burden down, won't you dry all your tears, lay your burden down. Friends, this divine intermission is a space in which to build community, to get to know one another and form the body of Christ here at Wood Street Worship. If you are new to this space, we hope that you'll find your way over to the table by the window and get yourself a coffee tumbler and share your contact information with us. This is also a time to give. God has given us so much, and we give back a portion to God and to this community in gratitude. We have an offering box at the back of the space, or you can make a gift online. 
And finally, please note that we will not have kids at music today, so elementary school kids should remain in worship after this time. Friends, enjoy the peace of Christ as we share in community with one another. All right, we've, uh, we've finally arrived at the end of our six-week journey through uh, Jesus' blessings in Matthew chapter 5. We, we come up on the blessing for the merciful today, uh, Matthew 5, 7. Uh, and then next week is uh, Youth Sunday. So you're going to hear from our young people. They'll be uh, reflecting and preaching and proclaiming the word in Wood Street Worship and all the other, uh, other services as well. Um, but uh, today we're going to be... Um, uh, discussing the misery of the merciful and how we bless or heal each other by drawing close to one another, by being physically proximate. But I want to start um, with uh, an anthropologist that I just discovered, uh, Margaret Mead. She's an accomplished anthropologist, uh, well-known in anthropology circles. Uh, and recently I read about um, her surprising response to a question that is connected to Jesus' blessing of the merciful. Dr. Mead was was asked by someone to name the earliest physical sign of human civilization. Earliest physical sign of human civilization. Now, you'd think that she would respond and say, oh, well, tools would indicate that we are civilized humans, or like art would indicate we're humans, or... or, um, like agriculture and farming, maybe. But instead of saying any of that, she, um, she answered that the discovery of a 15,000-year-old human femur uh, that had broken and then healed uh, was the oldest example or indication uh, that humans are civilized. And to explain her answer, she noted uh, that the healing process for a broken femur, I think the femur is here, isn't it? Cause, okay. I just realized I'm about to reach down and, and like hold it, and I was like, I don't know where it is, actually. Uh, but to explain, uh, she noted that the uh, healing process for a broken femur takes approximately six weeks. And in that time, the wounded person couldn't work, uh, hunt, or flee from any predators. Uh, the wounded person was incapable of contributing to their community. They just were kind of there. They couldn't do anything else. If they moved, they wouldn't be healing. They need to be cared for, and they actually need to be physically carried by other people during that time of helplessness. And interesting thing is that kind of support is unique to human beings. So no other species in the animal kingdom attends to the misery of someone else in their species by physically drawing close to the miserable. Dr. Mead said, our way of coping with weakness, as much as our ingenious technologies and arts, is what sets us apart as a species. So with that prelude, uh, I invite you to pray with me uh, as we prepare to receive the proclamation. God, take our meager words and give them meaning. Take our hearts and hold them open. Take our joy and make it full. Come, Holy Spirit, come whether we are ready or not. Amen. All right, I'm not going to argue with an accomplished anthropologist, but uh, I do think that there is more to the story of the human condition than Dr. Mead put on, right? You know, we do desire intimacy, real relationships, authentic interactions with each other, a, a sense of wholeness with the totality of God's creation. But we're also aware of the consequences that come with getting too close to someone else. You get too close to the misery of others and you will become miserable yourself. Stay away and you'll grow cold and you'll be alone. Or as Dr. Mead would say, you'll be uncivilized. In 1851, the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer introduced a fable that he called the porcupine's dilemma to explain why we remain separate from each other even though we desire connection and need to be close to one another. And he called it the porcupine's dilemma. He called it that after, after he observed a group of porcupines that were huddled together on a cold day. 
And as you imagine, a group of animals huddling together on a cold day to share each other's warmth would not be an extraordinary circumstance except that these animals were porcupines. And porcupines are covered in prickly quills uh, that offer protection from other animals. That's why they got them. And so on that day, as the porcupines began to draw close to one another to stay warm, they couldn't avoid getting pricked by each other also. And so the porcupines were then forced to disperse uh, because of the self-inflicted pain every time they came this way, you know. But the cold weather would draw them back together again. And of course, the same thing happened again and again. They just pricked each other apart. And over time, the group of porcupines found a happy medium uh, where they could get close enough to each other to benefit from each other's body heat without getting pricked. So Schopenhauer completed that fable by describing the dilemma of the porcupines as a metaphor for the universal condition of human beings. We are made to desire the benefit of close connections, but if we get too close to one another, it is possible and likely that we will get pricked by the discovery that, say, all porcupines are not perfect like we are, or we'll get pricked by the sting of rejection from a porcupine that doesn't share the same desire for connection as we do. So Schopenhauer concluded that this neutral space that develops between humans is characterized by manners and and politeness. And if anyone crosses the recognized natural neutral space of politeness, then they are encouraged immediately to keep their distance. Have, has this anybody, I mean, we talk about close talkers, you know, right? Somebody invades that neutral space to get close to us and immediately, you know, without even knowing our body can oftentimes just recoil and just be like this. Of course, they kind of keep moving towards us before you know it, you know, we're in the hallway. The fifth beatitude, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy, is a direct response to this dilemma, the porcupine's dilemma. The blessing on the merciful is a commendation for the children of God that draw near to one another even though they know misery is unavoidable and imminent. It's close by. It is a miserable place to be, so close to another person that the pain of the other is unavoidable. Their suffering's obvious and it's represented by their helplessness. And to be close to them, you cannot help but prick them with your own, say, shame or sin or suffering or sorrow. And so both of you are just despairing from one another's less than, than perfect and prickly personalities. That's where that term came from, prickly personality. And both of you are conscious of the persistent pangs that can't be avoided when two prickly people draw near to each other. And this is what makes the fifth beatitude to be merciful in order to receive mercy, a really miserable proposition. And I should be clear, though, mercy, um, as Jesus means it, is not about being nice to someone else. Uh, Mercy here in this text is more than just helping somebody cross the street. Mercy is not even forgiveness, right? To be merciful to somebody is like to forgive them. That's not what Jesus means here. Forgiveness anticipates a previous offense. Here, it's just be merciful, not in response to someone else. Just do it. And so in its most uncorrupted form, mercy is to recognize the misery of another and willfully choose to join them in their misery. Blessings. (laughs) Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I imagine if I said, how many of us think we're capable of mercy? Everybody would raise their hands, right? Just probably to join the crowd, even though you didn't think you were capable of it, because it'd be kind of strange if you just kept your hands in your lap when that question was asked. We're also especially confident when we define mercy in the sentimental, uh, tear-jerking way uh, that always comes with a happy ending. We're good at that. 
you know, just like they do in the movies. But before you write off this sermon as, as something that you have already mastered, consider this. The word misery is actually, or I'm sorry, the word mercy is actually derived from the word misery. Now, how many of us are willing to go there to be miserable on purpose? This isn't a blessing for the faint of heart or those expecting some sentimental expression of Christian virtue. Uh, This is not the movies that Jesus is in right now. To be merciful is to be miserable on purpose. So yes, you are now free to fear the practical implications of this beatitude. And you're not alone because I join you in trembling with fear when I hear these words, blessed are the miserable for they will receive more misery. I hear about misery-loving people every day. Um, These porcupines have all learned to live with constant pricks of their neighbor's misery, but they keep choosing to remain there. And often their stories don't, don't have a happy ending or happy beginning. They're simple stories. You know, they're school teachers or or social workers or, or healthcare workers that go and follow calls to care for undeserved communities that are too acquainted with their own misery to actually differentiate it from a normal way of life. And, and there are church members in this room that, that quietly go about their business, you know, transporting their siblings in Christ to appointments with doctors and, and taking them to hospitals. And there are also children that are purposefully, uh, that purposefully notice and draw near to their classmates that look miserable in their loneliness and their perpetual unpopularity. And these simple stories are worth telling in this room right now because otherwise, mercy, as we have just described it, will remain out of reach for all of us. And without stories like these, us ordinary porcupines will always just be excused from believing that Jesus' blessing has anything to do with any of us. To get close enough to get pricked over and over is not a sentimental expression of virtue. This is not about being nice or being polite. Subjecting yourself to somebody else's misery is a willful act that grows into a way of life. Blessed are the miserable, Jesus said, for they will receive more misery or mercy. Now, you might have noticed up to this point, we've just focused on the first half of this beatitude. We've we've said nothing about the second half. And we definitely have not asked the the most obvious question regarding this beatitude. And and, and it does concern the second half. And I think our conversation would really be incomplete this morning if we avoided it. Uh, The question is, uh, why do the merciful need more mercy? (laughs) This is the only beatitude uh, in which the gift is equivalent to the blessing. This blessing stands out amongst all the others uh, for its redundancy. Uh, Why not give the merciful a gift that they're actually lacking? You know, if if they're already merciful, why give them more mercy? Give them wisdom or like courage or comfort or devotion. You know, have you ever unwrapped a gift that someone's given to you and you got like a lot of excitement and anticipation and, and then you discover... Uh, that the thing that you expected to be a shiny new uh, addition to your collection of things uh, was something that you actually already owned. You, you know how def- it feels deflating, right? When you're just like, I already got that, you know? <laughs> but you can't say that. And there's no gift receipt included, so you can't even get store credit for it. I mean, I love presents, all of them. Big presents, small presents. But I don't want to repeat of a present that I already got. But it appears here that mercy has a different quality than other gifts. Mercy, it seems, is its own reward. Uh, The beatitude here reminds me of that children's song. Uh, I'm going to, like, start singing it, and then we can do it together if you want, if you know it. Uh, It's a terrible song. 
but it's perfect for this occasion. This is the song that never ends. Yes, it goes on and on, my friends. Some people started singing it, not knowing what it was, and they'll continue singing it forever just because this is the song that never Right? Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And those who receive mercy will become more merciful. And blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And so on and so forth. Till death do us part. You know, I suppose that Schopenhauer would have dismissed Jesus' vision of the merciful as recipients of even more mercy, as just this Pollyannish idea, you know, this impossible dream. Schopenhauer probably would have said, Cursed are the merciful who get clumsily close, for they will receive nothing but misery. And I don't think Schopenhauer would have been alone in this conclusion. Truth is, all of us are cautious in the company of strangers, aren't we? We're careful to cover up and disguise our own shadows, our own misery, by being polite enough to not be considered crude and being discreet enough to not let the secret out that at times we are all miserable as well. But when it's quiet and we're all alone, I imagine our thoughts and our desires echo those of the psalmist whose poetry includes again and again this line, have mercy on me, O God. And until I began working on this sermon, I considered that frequent plea of the psalmist, have mercy on me, O God, to be an appeal for forgiveness. But after this association between mercy and misery was revealed to me, and after the seemingly sentimental blessing of Jesus was disclosed as a radical challenge to the status quo, by which we all quietly agree to just leave each other alone lest we get too close and end up hurt, And after I was surprised to discover that mercy doesn't necessarily concern uh, giving money to, say, someone experiencing homelessness and begging for it on the sidewalk, but it is the part where I look them in the eye and I feel the grief of our separation. Or it may be the part where I get close enough to listen to a friend or my family or colleague that needs to talk about their misery for a minute or an hour. Or it may be the part where I come out from my disguise, you know, my vocation as a pastor and a preacher, that, that costume that we wear and, and that disguise, that, that costume that tells everybody, I'm the one with all the answers and none of the problems that afflict you all. <laughs> and I finally reveal my own misery. Or maybe it's the, part where we dare to draw near to the miserable without trying to fix them and instead say, I'm here and I'm not leaving. Or maybe it's the part where we adopt the voice of the psalmist who said, have mercy on me, O God. And we finally admit that we'd rather have God with us in our mercy, in our misery, than be separate from God, period. I know you didn't come to church this morning to hear this, but misery lurks, it lingers, it will not leave us alone in certain moments under the right circumstances. It might disappear for a little bit, but even then it didn't disappear. It just faded into the background, silent for a precious moment. But misery is just always wary of its own temporary exclusion from our consciousness. It's the reality of the human condition. It's what it means to be alive. That we are at the same time desperate to be connected to life and aware that there's something separating us. Oh, how our misery longs for mercy. We were created in the image of God in whom there is no separation but we can't evade the shadow that darkens the past that we pursue out in front and veils the past from the light of truth. We're separate but equal, but we yearn for more than equality. We're separate but equal in hope that our separation will one day be repaired. And we're separate but equal, and we desire the attachment to all that life has to 
offer more than we desire, equality even. Mercy, we're told today, is the only way to relieve the anxiety of separation. So let us join our voices to pronounce our own beatitude and say, blessed be the God who made us utterly dependent on each other. And blessed be the God who makes a way out for the miserable through the mercy of Jesus Christ. For it was Jesus who became the blessing that he pronounced by being miserable on purpose out of his great love for us, a misery that resulted in death, a misery that was redeemed by the promise of life for those that follow his way. And so blessed be the merciful who draw near to the miserable, for they will receive mercy and finally forever be one. In the name of God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. White lips, pale face, breathing in the snowflakes, burnt lungs, sour taste. Lights gone, days in, struggling to pay rent, long nights, strange men. And they say she's in the class 18, stuck in her daydream. Been this way since 18, but lately her face seems slowly sinking, wasting, crumbling like pastries. But they scream the worst things in life come free to us, cause we're just under the upper hand and go mad for a couple grams. She don't wanna go outside tonight, and in a pipe she flies to the motherland. A sells love to another man and It's too cold outside For angels to fly Angels to fly Ripped gloves, raincoat Tried to swim and stay afloat Dry house, wet clothes Loose change, bank notes, weary eye, dry throat, call girl, no phone. And they say she's in the class 18, stuck in her daydream. Been this way since 18, but lately her face seems slowly sinking, wasting, crumbling like pastries. And they scream, the worst things in life come free to us, cause we're just under the upper hand and go mad for a couple grams. She don't wanna go outside tonight, and in a pipe she flies to the motherland, but sells love to another man. Too cold outside for angels to fly. An angel will die covered in white. Closed eyes and hoping for a better life. And this time we'll fade out tonight straight down the line. in the class 18 stuck in her daydream 
been this way since 18 but lately her face seems slowly sinking wasting crumbling like pastries and they scream the worst things in life come free to us and we're all under the upper hand and go mad for a couple grams and we don't want to go outside tonight and in the pipe fly to the motherland or sell love to another man it's too cold outside for angels to fly angels to fly When we gather around a table, we remember what we have in common. We recall the humanity we share. Friends, this is the holy feast for you, the beloved children of God. At this table, Christ invites us to partake, to receive the mercy which he promises. At this table, grace is shared and love freely reigns. So come, come all of you. For all of you are invited and all of you are welcome here at this table. Let us pray. God of the table, for as long as two or more have gathered, you have been present, knitting together communities and relationships, families, friendships, and calling your people to journey together, reminding your creation that life is to be lived in mutuality and love, with graceful sharing and thoughtfulness and care. From the beginning, you have bestowed all of creation with your original blessing. When we come to this table, we feel the spirits of our ancestors in our midst, the ones who wandered in the wilderness in search of new life, the ones who cried out against injustice, and finally, the one who showed up in the fullness of flesh to break bread and share abundantly. When we gather around this table, we remember the humility and welcome of Jesus Christ, the way he touched and healed the vulnerable and wounded, the way he pulled out chairs for the unclean and the outcast, the way he turned water into wine so the party could continue, the way he blessed the nobodies, the brokenhearted, the miserable, and the marginalized. In the fullness of Christ's humanity, we are fully known. And so we trust at this table that in this bread and cup, the Spirit is at work in our lives, inching us closer to the promised day of grace and justice, when racism and gun violence will be no more, when soil and water and air will be restored, when all will sing together and no one will be alone. God, this day we offer you a multitude of prayers We especially pray for all who were unsheltered this week through ice and snow. God, warm our hearts so that we might respond with care for our neighbors. We pray for places of warfare, turmoil, authoritarianism, and poverty. God, bring your justice to bear so that all might know freedom and safety. And we pray for those who are acutely familiar with sorrow and grief, and despair. God, glow brightly for those who need a way forward. With these prayers and the prayers on our hearts as the gathered body of Christ, we pray all of this with the words that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus was at table with his disciples. And he took bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup and he poured it out, saying, This cup is the sign of the new covenant, sealed in my blood and shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim Christ's saving death until he comes again. And he is coming. So these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We will take communion by intinction. So you'll be invited to come forward to the front, either here or here. Receive a piece of gluten-free bread. You can dip it into the cup, eat it, and return to your seat. Friends, all are welcome, so come. If my communion service could come forward.
Thank y'all. Let us pray. God, at this table, you have filled us with good things. We know that you draw near here and that you call us to draw near to one another, showing mercy each and every day. So call us out from this table to be your people in the world. Amen. Let's rise together and sing as we close. God who's giving, God who's giving knows no end from your rich and in the store. Nature's wonder, Jesus' wisdom, costly cross, grave shattered door. Gifted by you, we turn to you, offering up ourselves in praise. Thankful song shall rise forever, gracious donor of our days. Skills and time, skills and time are ours for pressing toward the goals of Christ your Son. All at peace and health and freedom. Direct our daily labor, lest we strive for self alone. Born with talents, make us servants, fit to answer. Your grace conferred Ours to use for home and kindred And to spread the gospel word Open wide our hands in sharing As we heed Christ's ageless call Healing, teaching, and reclaiming Serving you by Friends, as you go hear this blessing, may the love of the faithful creator, the peace of the wounded healer, the joy of the challenging spirit, and the hope of the three in one go with you and encourage you this day and forevermore. Amen.